In this video, I'm going to cover the basics of taxonomy. Taxonomy is a field within plant science that focuses on naming organisms, describing them, and categorizing them. It's useful for us as practicing arborists to have a framework that we can attach new things to. So if you already know what an oak looks like, that it has acorns, when you see an, a new species that you haven't encountered before, it's easier for you to compare it to what you already know. And taxonomy offers a formal framework for that. It's important to recognize that taxonomy is very, um, the goal is to organize species based on how related they are, but this is a field that started a long time ago when they didn't have genetic analysis or any of these new technologies. So a lot of it was based on morphology. Morphology is a form of different parts. So what the leaves look like, the stems, the flowers, and it's really limited in what you can see visually with your naked eye with or with a hand lens or a microscope, things like that. Put it another way, I'm using silverware as an example here, and if you were to go strictly on the morphology or the form of these silverware, you might class, you might divide them up this way because these all look like forks, these all look like spoons. But in terms of relatedness, these might be best combined into one category because they're all plastic. So there is a lot of reorganizing happening and it's frustrating as a practitioner to have to keep track of that. But as long as you know where you can find that information, you don't have to memorize everything. It's good practice, but it's not absolutely necessary. The major taxons or categories are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and specific epithet. These last two here are what make up the species name. And starting from the top, this is the most general category, and this is the most ex exclusive. Phylum can also be called division. And the best way for you to memorize this order is with a mnemonic. The one that I learned is King Philip came over for good soup. The first letter of the mnemonic, of each word of the mnemonic, correlates with the first letter of each of these taxons. So, so that will at least help you remember the order of these terms. Um, I have some suffixes here. These are consistent for phylum through family. And if you see a name that has one of these suffixes, you'll know what level you're working with. Really, to me, the most important one is ACE because this is family. So for arborists, the most important are these three down here. Within a family, you'll usually have similar reproductive characteristics. So the flowers and the fruit will look similar. If you're able to get your family down, you'll be able to identify trees that you may have never have seen before that aren't even in your area. On this level, the genus is where we start getting more familiar. So oaks would be the Quercus genus. Maples would be Acer. And then you get more specific down to the species level with the specific epithet. So you'll have a coast live oak you'll have a silver maple. And this is what we use for the scientific name. Within the species, there can be more subcategories, such as subspecies, variety, and form. I want to make a disclaimer that as I was doing research for this video, I found that even within taxonomy as a field, there's a lot of arguments as to how you should divide up or combine these categories and the definitions are not completely clear. So, so my best understanding is that a subspecies develops when it's geographically isolated. And these 
isolated populations will develop distinct characteristics. They don't normally mix, but if you bring them together, they're going to be able to breed. An example is the Catalina ironwood. This is a tree species native to the Channel Islands off of the coast of California. So there's one subspecies, Asplenifolius, that's endemic to specific islands within the Channel Islands. There's another subspecies that's native to a different set of islands. So they don't actually have the opportunity to breed in nature, but they are compatible. The next subcategory below that is variety. These differences tend to be more minor, but they can be passed down to future generations. One of the examples that I'm aware of is honey locust. There's a variety in Nermis that is a thornless honey locust. And finally, you have forma or form. These usually differ from the other plants in a single characteristic, but they also occupy the same space. So you might have a population of plants with purple flowers and scattered throughout that you have white flowers. So it's not that you have a single mutation that makes that one plant have a different flower color, but it actually occurs often enough where they will consider it a separate form. If any of these mix together, whether artificially or in nature, you can form hybrids, which usually will have an intermediate characteristic. You can also have cultivars. A cultivar is a cultivated variety. This is something that must be isolated so that you can guarantee that characteristic. So let's say that you find this form and you want these white flowers. If you're able to cultivate it to the point where every single plant you get out of that original plant has white flowers, you can develop a cultivar. But this has to be micromanaged and normally they're propagated vegetatively and not sexually. What that means is you'll have to take cuttings, you might have to divide the roots, you'll have to find some way of duplicating that exact plant. So they tend to be clones. If you take seed from that plant and you plant it, you're not guaranteed to get that same, same characteristic. So an example of this is crepe myrtles. There are a ton of crepe myrtle cultivars out there mainly because of the different flower colors. So this is now considered an artificial variation of the original plant and is something that must be maintained in the horticulture industry.